Hey, welcome to my lunch hour. Stan Osterman here, Stan the Energy Man from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies, and this is a hint right here. It's International Bosses Day, so everybody that thinks I'm their boss gave me this lay today. And so if you have a boss and you didn't get him a lay, shame on you. You need to go out at your lunch break and get him a lay really quick and get a her or get your, your boss, if it's a lady, or her, or lay, a nice one, a nice orchid one, get back to your office quick. Anyway, today, we're going to talk about energy in the mode that I like to talk about, which is transportation energy. And we have with us from the State Energy Office, Margaret Larson, who, from my perspective, is kind of the plug-in electric vehicle expert in the Energy Office. At least she's the one that I go to when it comes to plug-in electric vehicles. So we're going to talk a lot about electric vehicles, and especially plug-in electric vehicles today. So, Margaret, welcome to the show. And thanks, thanks for being here. Thanks for and having me. Just give us a little idea of how you got into energy overall in, uh, in your life and what dragged you to the state energy office here in Honolulu. Well, it didn't really drag me. It was more of an opportunity to be with the state energy office in Hawaii. But I started my energy career back in Northern California. Um, I went to Humboldt State University where there's a lot of um, advanced, clean technology research going on there, specifically on the environmental side. And I was a journalist there studying journalism, and a lot of my friends were doing appropriate technology, environmental engineering, so I got a taste of it there and got really interested. And then I was able to work for the British Consulate at their trade and investment arm, mm -hmm. doing clean technology and for companies that were interested in coming over to the U.S. and setting up, or alternatively on the um, investment side, U.S. companies that were looking to set up and expand in England and further UK um, in the clean transportation and clean technology side. So I was able to do some research on that side. Then we're, my family was looking to um, come over to Hawaii and um, because I was aware of um, Hawaii's advancements and their clean energy goals, I figured that the experience I had would translate over, which I was lucky enough to find a role at the Hawaii State Energy Office. So I've been there for the past seven years now. So you started right off in Hawaii Energy Office? That, I did. That was your, that was yeah, good. I was lucky enough to find kind of a low man on the totem pole okay. job at energy clerk typist. And then through the American Recovery and Re Reinvestment Act, um, the state energy office was able to expand. And there was a clean transportation role there waiting for me. So I was able to move up. Oh, outstanding. Yeah. Yeah, we're lucky to capture you. Yeah, it was Great. nice. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about my favorite thing, transportation and plug-in electric vehicles. I know, I know when HCAT first started along, I, I say BS before Stan, when Tom Quinn was in the HCAT job, yep. the plug-in electric vehicles were a big part of HCAT's uh, repertoire. And, yeah. and I didn't spend that much time doing plug-in electric vehicles because by the time I came in, it was hydrogen. But mm -hmm. why don't you give us a little background on, on how plug-in electric vehicles really got started in Hawaii and your experience so far with with uh, electric vehicles here? Yeah, the State Energy Office worked really closely with Tom Quinn and has worked closely with HCAT for years. Uh, HCAT was really the leader in advancing EVs in the state and helped to proclaim EV Day back in the 90s. So the state of Hawaii recognized the significance of electric vehicles back in the 90s with the first wave of electric vehicles, um, kind of the EV1 days. But actually, it was the second wave of EVs because the very first car that came to Hawaii was an electric vehicle. Um, nonetheless, the... That's, that's true. We forget about that. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Uh, so HCAT uh, had put in a lot of efforts to bring over electric vehicles and, and started to install their, like, posi charge, fast chargers back in the day. I think they were looking at um, partnering with 7-Elevens back then, mm -hmm. uh, and they were successful in getting some EVs within state fleets. And uh, the challenge is, is, I think, the technology then... There's a, re a lot of reasons why the EV didn't work. If there's the, the movie, What Killed the Electric Car, and that's kind of an interesting take on um, the controversies um, behind what may or may not had led to like, the death of the EV back in the 90s. But regardless, um, Hawaii set forth a lot of great policies and a lot of programs that helped pave the way for the introduction of the EV in the 2000s and were successful today in electric vehicle adoption because of the work that HCAT had really helped the State Energy Office do back in the 90s. Yeah, Tom Quinn did a lot of uh, great stuff. In fact, he was in that job at least 18 or 19 years before I stepped in. So he, he yeah. covered a lot of territory, really got a lot of great things going in the state of Hawaii. And that's one of the reasons why it was so attractive to me to go work there. I really wasn't looking for a job, but when I heard he had gone 
and they were having a hard time replacing him, especially because of the background he had. You know, I felt uh, like it was a really good thing for me to jump into because I, I really, I like you, I have a passion for doing clean energy in Hawaii and, and, and the transportation side is really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. One of the things we talked about on one of my last shows was, um, you, funny you brought up electric vehicle. First, first vehicle in Hawaii was an electric vehicle. I, mm -hmm. I point out to people that the first Porsche was an electric vehicle. And many of the mm -hmm. early cars were electric vehicles because electric vehicles make sense. They have the torque, they have the power, they mm -hmm. have all the great things you want in a car. But the hard part's always been storage. And whether it's battery storage or hydrogen storage in an electric vehicle, mm -hmm. there's, that's always a challenge. Even in the hydrogen vehicles we have now, I mean, pressurizing to 10,000 PSI takes a lot of energy to pressurize a tank. So even in the hydrogen vehicles, it's still a challenge. The storage piece is a challenge. And that's why gasoline vehicles just kind of took off, gasoline and diesel. They, the storage piece was so much easier. Just mm -hmm. pour the gas in and you're off and running. Mm -hmm. So is there anything that you're aware of that where you see batteries going that, that, that maybe help the storage piece a little bit or make it a little more attractive? Or um, I'm not sure in terms of on the technology side if they're um, playing with different technologies for uh, batteries, but I do know that whatever advancements are being made, it seems that OEMs are starting to um, adopt those advancements and it sounds like 2017 or whatnot mm -hmm. like on I think Nissan is going to be putting out a vehicle that uh, has much more range than the Nissan Leaf that they, they currently have so it sounds like advancements are being made and in a quicker time period mm -hmm. than than maybe we had thought you know yeah, and I think sometimes as the new technologies come on the companies that are working them keep it kind of close hold yeah. because they they got patent issues and, and they want to get first to market and get it out there. So a lot of times we're just, we're hoping the technology's there, but we're just waiting and waiting and waiting. Yeah. And kind of the big clue you get is when you see those OEMs say, hey, we're gonna do this, and, and you see them going that way, and you don't understand why yet, but you, you know in your mind, they've got something that they're working that, that yeah. should be improving it. So that's kind of how I look at Toyota and Hyundai and companies like that doing the hydrogen. They put a lot of investment in there, and they, mm -hmm. they are, they're going that way for a reason. So yeah, and the, yeah, that's the, my optimism. Yeah, the good news is also is that we've attracted the attention of the OEM. So they're really interested in using Hawaii as a test bed to showcase their advancements in mm -hmm. batteries and, and hydrogen and whatnot. So you know, Toyota's coming over with their hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. Mm -hmm. uh, Tesla has a... Um, uh, it's not a dealership, a show, a showroom here, mm -hmm. um, and Nissan. We have the number two <coughs> Nissan dealer in the United States for electric vehicles. Yeah, and the number yeah. one in, in um, Hawaii was able to go over to Japan and, and meet with the CEO of Nissan. So it's really saying something that we have the number two yeah. Nissan Leaf dealer um, here in Hawaii. I haven't checked with DMV, but somebody told me a couple months ago that Tesla has sold more than 200 cars in Hawaii. And at first I was like, no way. Yeah. But then I started looking and I see them. There's one in my neighborhood. One of the guys I used to work with has one. Mm -hmm. There's one that parks at HCAT all the time. I see them all over. So I'm not surprised if it's yeah. over 200 or 300 vehicles yeah. now that Tesla sold here. And, yeah, I think they're doing pretty well. The one thing I really, that I think is neat about Tesla, the code that they broke isn't just the mileage thing, although that's really good. It's the styling piece. I mean, mm -hmm. no offense to Nissan, but the Leaf is just not my idea of a sexy car. <laughs> and I don't know why they can't make just sportier looking electric vehicles. Because I think if they would just go that extra little bit, because the design can't cost that much more. But if you just make them look a little bit cooler, they'd probably take off and go. I think a lot more people would drive them. It's a possibility. There's <laughs> different, different folks like different things. But yeah, you're right. The Tesla vehicle is pretty awesome. Yeah. But the state energy office has a Nissan LEAF, and I love driving that car. I don't have one for personal use, but whenever I get the chance to drive it for work, yeah. I better watch out. I know a lot of folks with around. them, and they love them. I yeah, mean, they're cool. They're great vehicles. Yeah, Sharon Moriwaki from, from ThinkTech has one. Um, I think Ray Starling has one. I know that Mark Takai, Congressman Takai, has one. Mm -hmm. um, he, he actually, when he was in the state legislature, was one of our big advocates was for renewable transportation in the vehicle side. He was yeah. a, a big he's advocate. Been a, he's been that. a big, big advocate for yeah. electric vehicle adoption. I think a lot of those folks, with the exception of Sharon, live in single family homes. Mm. Sharon, I think, lives in a condo, and she was really successful in putting in a charging station. 
it'd probably be worth my while to actually chat with her because that's mm -hmm. one of the major challenges to EV adoption is how to um, put charging stations in condos or apartments or multi-unit dwellings. And I gave Tesla and Nissan a call and my friends over there at the dealers and they're saying that is a big barrier and they'd be able to sell even more vehicles if, if we could uh, crack that nut. But it's an issue nationwide or internationally as well. What are, what are some of the, the uh, drawbacks on, on the condominium side? What are, what are some of the challenges that we face in the condominium dwellers um, realm uh, for rechargeable vehicle or charging stations? Yeah, I mean, I think bottom line is always the number one challenge in terms of the cost to actually make the installation happen and who's going to cover that cost and the fairness aspect. Um, and even if cost isn't an issue for some, um, say they could cover the cost of installation, which tends to be very high, although on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, sometimes the apartment or condo won't even have capacity, so mm. then then the cost really gets out of right. play, and then you have to increase capacity. But um, the state legislature last year, uh, or this this year, this session. yeah, the session passed um, Act 164 that establishes a working group to examine the issues and come up with recommendations or solutions um, pertaining to charging um, station installations and condos. Mm -hmm. So we had our first working group meeting on October 1st and our next one is coming up in a couple weeks on the 28th um, with a working group and it's Sunshine Law so it's open to everyone um, and it's to really examine how to solve that issue. It's very challenging for existing buildings but I think there could be opportunities on new construction. Yeah, I, I point out to a lot of folks, my house is pretty old. My house is over 50 years old. Mm -hmm. So, and I do a lot of remodeling myself. I'm a licensed contractor in cabinet and millwork and stuff. So I remodel my kitchen and places and I've had to rewire my house. And I point out to people that when they built those houses and a lot of the condominiums around here, we didn't have computers. We didn't have big screen TVs. We didn't have disposals. We didn't have dishwashers. We didn't have microwave ovens. We didn't have a lot of stuff that we have in our buildings now. Mm -hmm. So the buildings were designed for certain loads, and there, there's only so much power going into the building, and it's designed for the way the building was built. Yeah. And so when you talk about upgrading the building, you're not just talking about the charging station. You could be talking about a transformer outside the building, which could cost anywhere up to several hundred thousand dollars to replace mm -hmm. and who's going to foot the bill for the five people that have electric cars in a hundred person condominium building yeah. you know who is the community association going to pick up the cost i don't think that would be really popular if it's two hundred three hundred thousand dollars worth of bills yeah. just to support a couple tenants so there's there's some real issues to work through there but can be done and, and maybe that's where going to the legislature and saying hey to make this fair you know, it, it, it's just a technological matter that the buildings weren't suited that way. So how can the state government help incentivize if indeed we want to get to clean energy in transportation? Because like, like you know, we didn't do so on the transportation sector in the last Blue Planet uh, study. We're, yeah, we're at D minus. Right. Two years in a row we're at D minus. So you and I got to get hot on making this transportation stuff go a little bit, uh, move it up a little bit a notch or two and get it, get it cleaner. Definitely. So, the, yeah. so we're going to take Again. a quick break for a short, short break and get back with Margaret Larson in a few seconds and, and figure out how we're going to crack the nut on clean transportation in Hawaii. Hi, my name is Cindy Matsuki and I host the show High Growth with HTDC on Think Tech Hawaii. This is the show where we talk about all things tech, innovation, entrepreneurship, and manufacturing because there's so many things going on in Hawaii and more people should know about them. So this is the program that you can come and find out about all the things happening in Hawaii. And this show also airs on Level 54 along with Think Tech Hawaii. And it broadcasts live every, every other Tuesday at 3 p.m. So don't forget, check out the show Tuesday, 3 p.m. every other week. High growth with HTDC. Thanks. Hey, welcome back to my lunch hour, and we're here with Margaret Larson from the State Energy Office talking about electric vehicles, plug-in electric vehicles to be specific, and we just finished talking a little bit about some of the challenges, particularly with condominiums, uh, and trying to reinvigorate the plug-in infrastructure for vehicles around Honolulu. And um, one of the things that the State Energy Office uh, undertook this year, starting last year actually, was they commissioned a pretty in-depth study on the transportation sector in Hawaii 
And so all of us that, that work in the state and, and the, the, um, the stakeholders in the state participated in this thing. And, and Mark, why don't you tell us a little bit about how the Alan Lloyd project, as I like to refer to it, um, kind of got started and, and, how, and, and the things that are coming out from that. Yep. Um, it started with the leadership of the State Energy Office with our administrator, Mark Lick, who wanted to take a deeper um, analysis and a deeper dive at clean transportation and what we can be doing here in the state in terms of petroleum reduction um, and looking at the, from it from the side of what can you do and how much savings can we actually achieve rather than throwing a number out there and saying how do we get to that number. So uh, through procurement and whatnot, we. Um, selected the International Council on Clean Transportation. They're um, an NGO out of San Francisco, but they're also international. Uh, and they, through the leadership of their, I think their former CEO, Dr. Alan Lloyd, who used to head up the California Air Resource Board, they helped to um, lead our state energy office in the effort um, behind a transportation charrette, which included stakeholders, as you mentioned. Um, and, and fundamentally, what they did was create a report that looked at, um, through stakeholder engagement, um, an analysis of tactics that could be um, rolled out here in Hawaii to help reduce petroleum within ground transportation as well as air and marine. Um, and so they looked at, um, but they put out about 100 tactics, they narrowed them down, then narrowed it down again to about 22 tactics mm -hmm. that are primary or secondary tactics that could be done here, here in Hawaii. Um, on the EV side, they found that the tactics along the electric vehicle um, adoption side could reduce petroleum by 1 million gallons per year. Um, and some of the EV tactics that they noted were um, multi-unit dwelling charging, like we we're um, chatting about, as well as workplace, um, which is uh, workplace charging installation, um, which is a really great opportunity when you consider where folks are driving and or parking their vehicle all day long and where they would be charging, um, as well as time of use rates um, for EVs and, and working with the, the local utilities on that. So to try and get people to charge their vehicles when the utility uh, has no need for the renewable energy power. So the middle of the day and maybe late at night rather than right in that go home and cook dinner time frame where he goes pushing a lot of power out and they have a lot of demand for power. But yeah. charger vehicles when they have a lot of solar power coming into their grid from all the rooftop or at night when nobody's, when everybody's going to bed and going to sleep and charge your vehicles in those, those times. Yep. Yeah, exactly, okay. yes. Kind of smart charging can be a really valuable tool when we're trying to achieve the high penetration of renewable energy that we're, we're needing to um, achieve the 100% re renewable portfolio standard by 2045. Uh, and that smart charging is going to be influenced by um, EV adopters plugging in at the right time, and they'll be influenced by proper EV time use rates that'll kind of incentivize them mm -hmm. and or charging um, stations at locations where they are going to be charging during the day or in the middle of the night. Um, so that's where workplace really is a um, critical location. And the U.S. Department of Energy um, has recognized workplace charging as a um, key spot for charging um, installations and they've put out a uh, workplace charging challenge where it's a um, kind of a bunch of case studies and different entities that have installed charging stations and it's like kind of a peer-to-peer -peer or a, a way to um, learn from others on how to do it and then they will put your um, company's name up on the website and mm -hmm. basically walk you through the steps that you would need to get um, there and so far I don't know of any workplaces that have EV charging here in Hawaii um, but I think it's the state and utilities are very interested in trying to figure out how to encourage workplace charging here. Mm -hmm. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if that came out of the EV working group focused on multi-unit dwellings. I mean, it was already a little bit discussed as, you know, if you can't crack that nut for existing buildings and multi-unit dwellings, maybe we should look at workplace charging because where are vehicles yeah. during the day in any case exactly. and, and with the, the solar and whatnot. Exactly. Yeah, what's, has HECO been... I know Hico put a station out at Dole Cannery or Dole Plantation. Yeah. And they put they've got another one going in soon in Temple Valley. They're yeah, Kaneohe. Uh, have how many have they done so far? Are you aware of that? Do you, do you know how many? Yeah, are? they have. Um, so they received um, permission, whatnot, from the PUC to put up to 25, I believe, across their jurisdiction. Um, and to my understanding, they've put in three or four. I know they have one on Maui, um, and they have two here um, in Oahu, the ones that you mentioned. 
Uh, and so they are actively trying to find um, site hosts that will be partners with them um, because they can basically cover the insulation and the fast chargers and I think they've done procurement went out for bid for a few of those but now one of their major challenges is trying to find sites that are willing to allow them to have the one or two stalls and it may take two stalls because they're really wanting to abide by ADA requirements right. or even if there's not a requirement they just want to really want sure. to like be a leaders in the ADA space mm -hmm. Um, but from so they're looking for real estate in the public sector. They're looking for like at shopping centers or yeah. public places where um, where there's a variety of people coming through, not like at somebody's condominium. But they're they're tasked to go out into public sector and do this. Yeah, it's true. It's true. In in all fairness, they can't just go to one apartment complex. Although they have recognized that multi-unit dwelling charging is a challenge, and that if they could co-locate their fast charger near maybe a cluster multi-unit dwellings that would be lucrative mm -hmm. in terms of EV charging and location so I think that's an area that they are looking at is where is a decent spot or can they locate it on or near a multi-unit dwelling that other um, guests or, or residents can can all from different condos like mm -hmm. if it could be a partnership of, of some sort um, so that's a potential avenue um, but when they put the application in, it was to look at all of those different challenges. Okay. You know, we talked a little bit about the incentivizing of um, our technologies, whether they're any kind of the clean technologies. And, you know, you and I both work with the legislature, and it's a limited amount of capital they've got to work with. So a lot of times we do things like um, for the EVs, parking at an EV stall, um, using the HOV lane because you're an EV, things like that, mm -hmm. which are good incentives because they don't cost anything, but they're something that motivate people. Maybe just put them right over that, that line to where they'll go and commit to, to yeah. driving an electric vehicle. But I, I know that there's one, that, and this is one that people tell me about all the time that really upsets them, that they'll have non-electric vehicles parked in electric charging stalls. Yeah. And, you know, is is that a big problem from your perspective at the energy office as well? And if so, I mean, how do we get uh, the, the police chief and, and the county police uh, folks to start enforcing that a little bit more? Is that something the state energy office is looking at? Or Enforcement is definitely a challenge. Um, there is a law on the books that says if you are a uh, non-EV parked in an EV stall, then you can be subject to a fine. And I think the fine is like Thirty or fifty dollars up to a hundred dollars, and I worked with the um, Honolulu Police Department to ensure that that was a line item on their ticket stub, so they could issue a ticket. Um, I'm not sure about the neighbor islands, to be fair, but um, it, it is a state law that they're allowed to issue you a ticket. It's just a matter of if they're actually enforcing right. it. And then if they're going to go to Alamoana, for instance, and enforce it there as well. Right, on but, private property. Yeah, yeah, and I've heard that, so that's a major issue, and enforcement is always a challenge. Mm -hmm. But what's also a challenge is EV to EV, and EVs that are um, parked too long or are charging, uh, and they're not charging, um, at the EV stalls and basically t hogging that stall, mm -hmm. um, and there's not enough turnover. And so enforcement behind that, but also I think it's, um, I've seen some charging station technology um, through like different softwares where charging um, pricing uh, can help to um, solve that issue and incentivize people to, to basically okay. get out of that stall. Um, so Is that stuff that your working group's gonna look at then when you get it going, you think? There's the Hawaii EV, or Hawaii EV Partnership that Blue Planet Foundation and the Honolulu Plain Cities and Nissan North America have, have partnered up to create and that's a public private kind of stakeholder group mm -hmm. and that group meets about quarterly and talks about topics like this and how to maybe um, recommend legislation or whatnot um, or there are some charging station companies that are on that working group and so the discussion of how to um, encourage or um, deploy smart technology that can incentivize people to um, basically you increase the rate after a certain amount of time so it'll encourage them to, to get out of the stall so it's discussed within the that's that space um, the state energy office is aware of the issue I, I know yeah. that in the state capitol there's an EV charging station at the basement of the state capitol but 
has the state put any other stations in on state, uh, like state parking stalls or whatever, in, in state areas where, you know, it, it's actually for the public and, and the state is, is actually setting the example or, sh or showing the way? Yeah, um, through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, we um, had set aside $5 million to the, through the state energy office specifically for EV uh, programs. And um, part of that money is went to the state and the counties to deploy and install EV charging stations. Mm -hmm. So the Department of Accounting General Services at the state um, had actually installed a few EV charging stations. I think they have like one at Punchbowl, one, one at the Capitol, a few others. Um, actually, the state energy office put out a app where you can actually go and find those stations. Mm -hmm. um, it's called EV Stations Hawaii. And we partnered um, with PlugShare, which is a very popular EV charging location app. And we partnered with them to basically share information. So we have the same information that PlugShare has. And any new charging stations that I find out about, I, I share with PlugShare. Um, so if you're looking for where those charging stations may be, you can mm -hmm. go to um, EV Stations Hawaii. Um, you can download that for free. Um, but yeah, the state did take leadership and installed a few um, charging stations at their lots. And then, you know, you mentioned PlugShare. There's, there's companies out there that will actually go to, your work, go to a, um, a commercial location and install a um, charging station, and they have a way of either charging for advertising or something. They, they do something there to make it either free mm -hmm. or a way that you can, like, swipe your charge card and, and pay for electricity. Are, how many companies do we have like that in Hawaii actually operating? Are there just a handful, or is it real popular on the mainland? Has it taken off on the mainland? And how... How do we kind of share info with the mainland to get those things over here? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we have about, um, I think it's like about 400 or so um, charging ports, so spots that you can go to. Um, but in terms of the charging companies that are active here in Hawaii, we have two which are Hawaii businesses um, and or have a direct office here in Hawaii, uh, Volta uh, and OpConnect. Um, along, uh, in addition to the others, there's probably another half dozen or so that have a presence here in Hawaii. We have a full list on our website. Um, if you go to electricvehicle.hawaii.gov, or you can also go to energy.hawaii.gov and go to our um, EV page off of there. And we have a list of all the networks um, and how those networks operate and what their costs are and whatnot. Because as you said, some of them um, uh, use advertising or some of them have a credit card or whatnot. And so it explains kind of what the different functionalities are. Um, but one of the challenges are actually getting the attention of those charging companies <coughs> to really have a lot of um, not influence, but a lot of participation here in the state and ener in the energy realm here. Um, I think we are a small community that is always looking for more support um, and good ideas from the mainland. And so it's always nice to have a larger uh, sector and marketplace of players that can um, interact and, and share best practices. So um, I'm always trying to rally and encourage companies to come over more often for meetings or really participate in the legislative session. Um, ChargePoint actually is another company, and they're starting to come over a little bit more. Um, but the companies that do have a presence here in Hawaii, they have local electricians that um, are certified to install their charging stations. And I do meet with some of the charging companies. Um, probably quarterly they come out. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it's tricky because um, if it goes, if it breaks, then um, you really hope that there's a local electrician that can, right. can, can fix it which is why it's really great to have <clears throat> local companies. Okay. Well, we're going to take another quick break here, and when we come back, we'll talk a little bit about the future of, of all this technology in Hawaii and uh, maybe talk a little bit about what we can do in the legislature to, to help move things along. Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward to, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia, and by Asia we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world, uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. 
just a little a little trivia welcome back to our, our show stan energy man but just a little bit of trivia for those of you that aren't big energy watchers like uh margaret and i um that company ictc that alan lloyd runs um I, I ICCT. ICCT rather sorry um they're the ones that kind of blew the whistle on Volkswagen. So if you're looking for a hero, we locked up to a good company that really knows what they're doing in energy and transportation um, because they're the ones that realized that uh, the testing was kind of being uh, circumvented in California for their uh, emissions testing. So it's a good company. We, we locked into a good company to help Hawaii do our, our master planning. And from that master planning, um, we're hoping that there's a lot of good things that we can move forward with in Hawaii and get moving on clean technology in the transportation sector. So, so Margaret, what are some of the things that we're kind of looking forward to over the next couple months and, and out into the future to help us uh, get where we really want to be with plug-in electric vehicles? Yeah, so we can get a better score in the blue plan or yeah, the scorecard exactly. for next year. I hate, I hate getting less than a C. Or I mean, D, minus. <laughs> Did we, or did we get a C this we, year? No, we got a D yeah, minus. Yeah. I'm, I'm, so. I'm looking for at least let's, a C. Yeah, let's go see next year. Well, hopefully the report, um, well, actually the report did highlight 22 tactics, tactics and, and hopefully that those can be implemented in a shorter than longer near term. And what we're doing next week actually is having a large stakeholder meeting on the 22nd. Everyone's invited to attend that as well at the Foreign Trade Zone from 9 to noon and that will look at what are how can we go ahead with implementation for those clean transportation tactics that were identified through the analysis the 22 tactics and what we'd like to see is is like a business plan or an implementation plan um, drafted and be supported by a lead or whatnot um, and there may be some electric vehicle components out of that as well because there were a few that were identified mm -hmm. um, within the report and, and some that were identified that I had mentioned before was the workplace and the multi-unit dwellings um, and through the Act 164 working group we hope that there will be some type of recommendation that will come out of, of that. That's the goal of the working group um, and my office as well as the Legislative Reference Bureau is responsible for drafting that report that will be sent to the legislature for early next session. Uh, the beginning of the session and so there may be legislative proposals that come out of that and that will be um, one that our office would be participating through the legislative session on uh, and then another area that I'm not sure we're going to do with legislation but we're working closely on um, maybe drafting an implementation plan or um, looking at what the business case would be or the research behind it is is looking how to incorporate electric vehicles um, into state and county rental um, programs um, like a prioritization perhaps or at least just allow it so um, I work for the state mm -hmm. when I need to rent a vehicle for state work like if I go to Maui for a Maui meeting or whatnot and I need to rent a vehicle currently I don't have the option to rent an electric vehicle mm. um, and we hope that we can work with procurement and um, maybe update the contract to see if we can include yeah. electric vehicles. Or that even sounds like one of those no cost it's things kind of that a you no can brainer. do. That, yeah, yeah. Real easy. So we'll see, um, or, or even hybrids. Um, mm -hmm. You can't even rent a hybrid. So, um, mm -hmm. and I think that would that may also encourage further EV adoption, um, even on the, maybe the neighbor islands, because right now I don't think there's too many EV options for rental on yeah. the neighbor islands so if that was um, implemented that might encourage that, that's really adoption. important you know because a lot of I, I i don't know a lot of people will go out and rent a car to see what it's like rather than go to a dealership for a test drive yeah they want to drive it for a couple of days they want to check it out they want to ring it out and they'll go to a rental car company and they'll rent the car so we need to kind of incentivize the rental car companies and and maybe taxi cabs too to to start using plug-in so that people get the experience and can see what it's like and and i think when pe people a lot of times they think of electric vehicles like glorified golf carts with their lacking power and 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 you know mm -hmm. they're not i mean if you've ever pulled up next to a tesla thought it was racing with you um, you'd learn fast that they can really get up and go quick mm -hmm. and, or even um, a nissan leaf yeah or a nissan leaf or any of the other ones. they, they yeah. may not look like They've a race a car way. but they can yeah. they can take up and move um, so it's neat that people can get the experience and the rental car market is one where here in Hawaii we've got tons of rental car companies here doing a lot of business and there should be some incentives we put out with them to, to get more uh, of the alternative fuel vehicles and hybrids available for people to, to rent and try them out. 
Yeah, another of the tactics was to look at how to encourage um, vehicle efficiency within taxis. So uh, maybe plug-ins or, or maybe um, hybrid vehicles. Um, and something just to note is the state of Hawaii defines electric vehicle to include both plug-in hybrid as well as all electric battery. So you have your Nissan Leaf and your Teslas, but you also have your uh, Volts in mm -hmm. your plug-in Prius. So essentially as long as it has a plug right now, um, but there's also been discussion about including hydrogen. Right now the law does not include hydrogen, um, but the state you know, sees hydrogen as an electric drive mm -hmm. vehicle as it is. And so that is another legislative um, proposal that was introduced last session. Mm -hmm. And this year I think is a biennium, which means it carries over. So that yeah, might if, very well come up again. If it's a fuel again. cell vehicle. Yeah, if it's an electric fuel cell vehicle and yeah. it runs off hydrogen, yeah. it, it could be a considered electric vehicle because it is. It's got an electric motor that mm -hmm. drives it and batteries. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there are some internal combustion hydrogen vehicles out there. And, you know, I, I think one of the things that I'm, I'm really cautious of because maybe making the transition to hydrogen may include converting some vehicles to be internal combustion hydrogen mm -hmm. rather than uh, fuel cells. So I'm kind of sensitive to that point that if we're going to include hydrogen in the electric vehicle discussion, mm -hmm. that we, we narrow it down to hydrogen fuel cell vehicles yeah. because if it's an internal combustion vehicle, Maybe it shouldn't be on that other list unless unless everybody tells me that that should happen. But mm -hmm. but it's good that we include that technology, the green technology, especially in plugins, um, because one of the things that came up when that legislation was going through last year was well, what if a hydrogen vehicle pulls into a charging station and parks there? He's got an EV license plate and he can legally park there, but he doesn't take any plug-in power. Mm -hmm. And and there's already enough problems with, with enforcement, like you said, yeah. so I can see where that's a stumbling block for yeah. some of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's something that the legislature would hopefully try to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And and you would want to hope that they would respect that they're not going to need that charger. But like you said, it's it's already happening with even EV to EV. It's it's a parking stall, and, and parking is, is limited here. Mm -hmm. So you're going to take what you can get. Um, but I, it would be as more OEMs start to roll out hydrogen vehicles, it actually is a really important uh, incentive to um, encourage OEMs to bring vehicles out here, knowing that there are incentives for their vehicles. Um, so it's, it's a, an issue that the ledge would hopefully kind of look at or we can work with them. Oh, great. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that I've talked about on some of my other shows, um, and we were talking earlier about the grid, but it, it actually gets into future stuff, is I, I tell people that when plug-in electric vehicles first came on the scene, they were looked at as just getting their power from the grid. In other words, that's where they got their energy. Mm -hmm. But now we're starting to look at the challenges that um, Hawaiian Electric and the other utilities have with storing power when they have a lot of uh, photovoltaics or wind given the power they don't they can't use right now mm -hmm. how do you store energy for later in the day and mm -hmm. one of the answers comes back vehicles mm -hmm. the more plug-in vehicles we have on the grid plugged into houses and things like that if that plug-in storage can be utilized out in the grid it could actually help with lowering the uh, amount of spinning reserves that hawaiian electric has to have it it helps absorb more renewables on rooftops and things like that so um, you know, what are some of the other things that the energy office kind of looks at in, in terms of kind of meshing the, the grid with, with transportation? Uh, is there any other, any other stuff that they're looking at right now or that came out of the plan from, mm -hmm. uh, from Alan Lloyd? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, our office is definitely looking at the synergies between electric vehicles and hydrogen, um, so clean transportation with energy storage and um, the overall energy ecosystem and really trying to bridge the two together. Um, and the energy office brought um, on my new boss, Chris Junker, who was previously with San Diego Gas and Electric. And because it's boss's day, I, m I might as well put in a great plug for him that he's an amazing, where's my camera? <laughs> he's an awesome boss. And what is what he's really tasked with is creating an energy roadmap for um, the state and to look at both transportation and energy. And he's um, really into modeling and, and numbers and whatnot. And he's created these um, really great set of data that looks at how EVs and hydrogen can really play as a significant storage um, and looking at the different times of day and, and the renewables that are on board and looking at all the different islands and, um, and looking at how each island can um, achieve that 100%. Um, so he has a really big job, mm -hmm. um, but he 
he's doing a great job at it and our the model that the state energy office is creating is, is really impressive so that's that's part of the task is to integrate transportation with energy and looking at those numbers and the data to um, create an energy roadmap is, is there much going on on the neighbor islands with plug-in electric vehicles we talked a little bit about maui mm -hmm. having one of the heco stations but what about especially the smaller ones like Lanai and Molokai? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, are, is there any any interest right now for them to have the via, any electric vehicles, or is that kind of that's that's kind of still out there yet to be mm -hmm. new frontier territory for the energy office? Well, Maui um, County uh, has been blessed to have the Jump Smart program, which is a partnership mm -hmm. between um, Japan and the U.S. and doing. Um, deployment of electric vehicles and, and fast charging stations and they um, just finished their phase one um, which they put in a lot of fast chargers in the community on uh, Maui Island uh, as well as some charging stations in their volunteers um, homes um, and using Nissan Leafs and, and it's kind of a smart grid um, demonstration utilizing electric vehicle technology and then their second phase is actually looking at how to do a bi-directional building to or like a home to EV um, kind of storage bi-directional um, and they have been successful in their phase one so they're looking for volunteers for the phase two and they're going to be adding even more fast chargers so Maui Island is in pretty good shape I personally mm -hmm. think on, on that side of things um, what also Maui has done in the past through a partnership with the State Energy Office and um, Honolulu Clean Cities was um, did a we received a grant from the US Department of Energy to essentially um, use the knowledge that we had here in um, Honolulu and, and Oahu um, of EV adoption across the state the, the state um, leadership with the stimulus program and to um, kind of do a shared learning experience with Maui and share with them what we learned so they can EV ready their island and their county and what they did is made a um, EV readiness plan for Maui County Indeed. in which they went out to the neighbor islands to Molokai and Lanai um, and uh, learned about the um, interest there and their challenges there and how many EVs they have and the rental cars and so they have a really great report um, that you can find off of our State Energy Office website um, about the, the Maui program. Yeah, I bet Lanai would be the perfect place to, to do a program because their driving ranges are pretty controlled. They're not, not really long. They're, they're really focused, and they, you know, they have a lot of private uh, interest on the island and uh, tourism, a big uh, high-end local mm -hmm. tourism, mm -hmm. um, and some good local community. Uh, that seemed like a, a good place to maybe try plug-in electrics and, and really get a good, uh, a good lead on them where they could actually have per capita a pretty good share of EVs in, in Lanai. That would yeah. be good. Yeah, for sure. And then the Big Island, actually, I've been watching their um, Facebook page for the Big Island EV Association, and they're doing great things. I mean, they they had an EV rally. I think September was EV Awareness Month or something like that, and, and they did a big event. They have put in a couple fast chargers, and so through a grassroots effort through the EV, the Big Island EV Association, they've been really doing quite a lot in terms of education and outreach on how to encourage more EVs there on the Big Island. There's, you know, the folks on the Big Island tend to be pretty animated when it comes to this stuff. They're, they're good on the hydrogen side as well. There's yeah. a lot of great interest in hydrogen on the Big Island, and of course, Blue Planet Research has, you know, their main uh, facilities over there doing their studies, mm -hmm. and and NREL's over there. So they're kind of they have a, a bent towards doing the clean transportation and clean energy stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, believe it or not, we've pretty much blown through 45 minutes of your day and, and your lunch hour. Uh, and I thank you for being here. It's been uh, it's been great talking to Margaret, and we'll have her come back uh, sometime, probably as we get through the legislature, and see what new bills and things you and the Energy Office can come up with to help us on transportation. Sounds good. Thanks so, so much for having Margaret, me. Thanks for being here today. And thank you. Until next week, we'll see you uh, next Friday at Stanley Energy Man. Aloha.